you should be mm -hmm. able to hear the music or um the the the, the creator's intent not right. the speaker and and as you spend more and more money that's when the speakers disappear i can play um pink floyd or um uh led zeppelin or bach on a, a pair of speakers and you'll recognize it as bach but it'll sound like bach being played back on a pair of speakers right right a good set of speakers or a good hi-fi system it's just your favorite artist in your room Happy listening from our sponsor, SVS. Acclaimed for punching well above their class, experience thrilling and immersive sound from SVS speakers, subwoofers, and cables. Join the sound revolution today. Visit svsound.com. Welcome. This is Brian Mitchell, your host and founder of Acoustics.com. Today, our very special guest is Philip Jones, Director of Global Brand Activation at Sound United and co-owner of the website ProjectorReviews.com. He has over a 20-year history in working in the audio-video industry with previous positions at Yamaha and Sony. If there's something you want to know about home theater or home audio, I think Philip is the person with all the answers. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> Philip. Hey, thanks. <laughs> Welcome for the to the podcast. Introduction. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well. Pleasure. Yeah, I mean, you have a uh, quite a history in this industry, and um, one of the things you say on the Projector Reviews website is you call yourself storyteller in chief and knower of many technical things. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd, I'd like to start by simply saying, "Tell me a story." Okay. Well, um, a story. Well, ah, wow, you put me on the spot, but um. <laughs> But I will say that um, I do I have a passion for this for this industry. I've been doing it for forever. And mm -hmm. it's funny. It's like not only can I tell you how imaging works, I can hit a I can hit a object with a torpedo from 15 for 50,000 yards away because I used to be a sonar tech. So so right. sound is we always say video without audio is just surveillance. Mm. So we definitely want to make sure that we talk about all parts right. of a great entertainment experience. And like I said, hanging out with people that care as much about video and audio as I do is always, always a pleasure. Yeah. So talk about that sonar experience. How did that, how, how do you get experience doing that? Okay. Well, I, um, as a, as a young person, I was always in the stereo equipment. So I was the guy that rode down to the local stereo shop on their bike to hang mm -hmm. out with the old crusty guy with the cigar while he played, you know, Floyd and, and Zeppelin on, yeah. on the hi-fi systems. So I always knew I wanted to be involved with sound. So mm -hmm. after I got out of high school, I was looking for something to do. And, um, I got, I got an opportunity to uh, join the Navy. And yeah. I wanted to be around sound. So the perfect thing to do was to be a submarine sonar tech. So this has to do around the same time as the Hunt for Red October came out. And there was a, a black sonar tech named Jonesy. And basically, if you ever watched the movie, the stuff that he used to do about con sonar contact, you know, 10,000 yards, right. a Kula, that's, that's what I used to do for a living. And it's, it's amazing that um, the concept about how hi-fi works, you know, how mm. imaging works, all that still applies to the same principle that is used, like I said, to hit an object with a torpedo from, from 10 miles away. Right. I, it's my understanding they're using sound distances to measure mm -hmm. how to hit something, right? They're just exactly. using sound. Right? Yeah, exactly. If you listen to how, if you think about how your ears work, you can localize where an object is based on the frequency, phase, and timing that mm. arise between your left ear and your right ear. Okay. So if I'm standing to the left of you, the sound's going to be of higher intensity on your left ear, hmm. and it's going to arrive there a little sooner, and, okay. um, and your brain is going to tell you, it's going to help you localize it. Well, right. well, a submarine doesn't use, you already watch the movie, and you hear the little pinging, the little right. boo, boo of a submarine. Mm -hmm. You don't right. do that. That's like holding a flashlight in a dark room. You'll find a person that you're looking for, but they would have seen you long before you see them. So what mm -hmm. it is, is a big old, basically array of microphones in the front of the submarine, or we pull behind it, and based on the arrival time mm. and the angle that the sound arrives, we can determine a, a where an object is located. And then, of course, each object has its own frequency. Right. And if something is coming at you, the frequency is higher than if it's going away. Think of the room of a car going by. Right. So by using right. all of those principles, 
um, we could determine what the target is, how far away it is, and what direction it's going. So same thing applies to music. If I if I start playing with phase it, and and things like that, you'll feel like it's behind you. If hmm. I if I uh, so by changing frequencies, I can make it sound like it's approaching you or or going away from you. So all of the things that happen in reality can actually be put into a recording, um, whether hmm. it's a movie or music, to really pull you into what you're watching. Hmm. Well. This is probably something you won't hear much talked about on a hi-fi podcast, but mm -hmm. what's life like on a submarine? <laughs> so, um, when you're young, you don't think about the fact that you could probably die on the thing. It, it was just an, it's an exciting thing to do when you're 18 years old. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty tall. I'm like 6'2". So I'm getting towards the, 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 the higher end and the top end of where you would be on the sub. Right. There was, there's basically two crews on a submarine that I was on. Because it was one of the ones that carried the big, you know, ICBM um, uh, intercontinental missiles. Right. So you only worked, you know, I would say two crews. So you'd be gone for three months and you would come back and give it to the other crew and they'd be gone for three months, which is how I actually got into high fi because half the year the ship mm. that I was on was gone. So my girlfriend, who now is my wife, was like, well, you're always messing around with stereo equipment. Why mm. don't you get a job at a stereo store because you're always in there anyway? So right. I started doing that part time and uh -huh. eventually I realized that, hey, um, I'm having as much fun and making almost as much money selling hi-fi equipment back in the um, late 80s, early 90s that I might as well just leave the military and do that after 10 years. Oh, wow. So what was it like working in retail then as a young person getting into the space? Um, what I liked about retail um, back then was there was a lot of people who were career salespeople. And this was their job. Their job was to show you the differences between brand A or brand B or show you why audio was not a commodity. Mm. And that really is, is difficult to find now. It used to be these small regional right. um, dealers everywhere. And you would learn as a young person that there's something better. You may right. have went in there like I did to buy a boom box. But at the same time, you would sit down in the hi-fi room and he would show you something better. And that would be programmed in your head that mm. – um, if I spend two grand, I'm going to get good. If I spend four grand, I'm going to get better. If I spend 10 grand, it's going to be better. Right. And trying to explain that to people now who are limited to these big box, like a Best Buy store, that your local Best Buy store may not have a hi-fi room. So how do you learn mm. um, those types of things? So I was I was in the golden age where you know CDs were first coming out and surround right. sound was first coming out. And this was a – so um, big car stereo. Was, mm -hmm. was was getting popular so it was a it was a great time to sell electronics because people were it were really curious about it that was one of their main recreational activities um and i didn't have to explain to people that right. sound was not a commodity right but do you feel like you have to explain that now more than ever we're I like 20 30 years be, beyond that point right no, most people assume that, I mean, if that was the case, that'd be true. But most people think great sound is their earbuds for their iPhone right. or, or a, um, we make sound bars, but just, but that's, we always say, do not remove, reduce. Um, you want to have great sound and great picture and a sound bar is going to make a massive leap in your, in your experience compared to listening to your TV speakers, but comparing a sound bar to a pair of components is, is, is noticeable. So. Right. It's hard to explain that just by talking. Mm. They have to experience it, and and right. those locations to do that are um, are, are becoming less and less common. So now right. it's better about trying to relay it in conversations like we're having um, right. online um, to try to explain to people what imagine what you're going to get when you get this home. Right, right. So, yeah, it, it's definitely easier to experience things and to feel them. And with more stores, like you said, shutting down, do you mm -hmm. think that's going to be? Do you think that's going to have some long-term impact on the industry when people like yourself were young, they could just go out and mm -hmm. hear this stuff without much effort? Now they have to seek it out through YouTube and yeah. podcasts and websites. Yeah, normally new hi-fi enthusiasts are exposed to hi-fi now by old hi-fi enthusiasts. Okay. You know. Um, my, uh, it, my son may not be, in, be a hi-fi person right now, but his best friend may come over and watch a movie or, mm. or see my system. And, and while I'm sitting there playing music, he may get drawn into it. So right. a lot of it. So now it's almost like 
um, the average consumer, the enthusiast is going to have to kind of carry that flag um, for for the next generation. We're going to have to be the ones to show our kids, um, our next door neighbors, our friends that mm. it's better and there's something right. better um, because right. they, they're, they're not getting exposed to it as much in, in retail environments. And then once they get curious about it and they start researching it, um, it, 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 that you can still get, a, you can still, people will still buy better stuff once right. they realize it's better and they start doing their research. Right. So when people come over to your house, what system are they hearing uh, or well, how many well, systems? <laughs> well, one of the reasons why my wife, cause I have, like I said, I have two, I have two, I have two jobs. Um, I do stereo equipment during the day and then I play with big projectors at night. Mm. And of course, one of the reasons why I like the stereo equipment portion of it is if I didn't work in stereo, I would have to buy all this stuff. So, right. so it's nice to be able to bring it home and test it. So, so what I have at home right now is it's it's a combination of most it's Marantz and it's Marantz and Bowers and Wilkins with a little bit of um, so I have some you know Marantz Model 30 in my office with the CD30 with a pair of Marantz 805 D3s. That's my office system. In my living room, I have an AV8805 um, connected to an M8077 um, okay. seven-channel amp and a PM10 driving. I have a Wilson audio system in my um, in my main system. So it's okay. Wilson so you broke system. away from Sound United with the well, Wilson. The funny thing about it is, I, I I've had those speakers for about um, I would say about ten years, fifteen years. My right. wife thinks they look like R2D2, and she wants them out of the house. <laughs> Um, but I, so I just, I, I'm planning on actually, um, getting rid of the Wilsons and doing these days, you can do a, a beautiful sounding system that you can't see. Mm -hmm. So I'm probably going to go into something like a Bowers and Wilkins custom theater or like a custom theater or architectural theater, um, right. type system where I can have, you know, a, um, 800 series quality without my right. wife seeing anything. Yep. So, you know, happy spouse, happy life. Right. So, right. Right. Now, there's something interesting you said about can't seeing it because mm -hmm. you can't see it, but you can hear it. But how do you sell something that you can't see? Well, this is interesting. We actually have a high end theater in the office and mm -hmm. um, everything is hidden. So it's a 165 inch screen, uh, $300,000 worth of Class A Marantz and, and Bowers sound system. And you don't see anything. Mm -hmm. And people are totally pulled into the experience. And then we hit the lights and show them where the magic happens. Because the because the big thing it comes down to is the emotional being pulled into what you're listening to and what you're watching. All right. of the equipment that we're selling is just a way to get you there. Right. Some of us like to play with the wires and look at the stuff, but uh, but most people just want to be immersed in a incredible audio and video experience, and they really don't care how it's done. Right. Uh, every once in a while, it's, it's nice to hit the lights and show them where the magic happens. So right. for me, I get my big over-the-top experience. My wife gets the big over-the-top experience. And when it's turned off, Nobody it doesn't have it. the reminder that there's things there. So, right. so some of us like to look at electronics like jewelry. Like if you mm -hmm. look behind me, it's the new, it's something like a Model 30. Um, okay. A lot of Marantz pieces are, are like jewelry. People want them front and center. But some people, they um, on a high-end system, it may be three, ba three stories down in a basement. Because right. they're they're more about the big screen and what's what it's doing, not what product is actually doing. Right, right. So, how have things changed over the years, going back to how you were selling in your early days of retail versus when you started at Yamaha and then Sony? Yeah. Well, the first thing, like we already talked about, the ability to the demo spaces to show it. Right. Um, that's a disadvantage. Hmm. The advantage is you used to have to sacrifice performance for convenience. So when the iPad, when the uh, when the um, iPod came out, you could have a hundred and something songs in your pocket, or right. a thousand songs in your pocket, but they were not CD quality. They were not as good as they could be. Right. Now with better streaming services, music download services, services like Kaleidoscape for download movies, you can have hmm. hundreds of movies and songs, a thousand millions of songs available at at really 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 high quality. So right. so now you don't have to sacrifice performance for convenience but now you have all this performance and you have to make sure that people realize that you're are you really getting all of it from your earbuds or a small wireless speaker sitting on your desk 
right. when um, you can have something better. Like this is my office right now. And mm -hmm. what I have are two definitive um, small, if I could pull one out, two definitive small satellite speakers, a, mm -hmm. DN, a DN8 subwoofer, and um, a Denon, uh, um, uh, think of it almost, not like a mini system, but a but like a small European hi-fi. So okay. people come into my office and they're used to like a like a, a regular hi-fi system connected to your computer. And they go, wow, that's what Spotify sounds like on your computer? You go, yeah, that's what Spotify or, or right. Tidal sounds like on my computer. So right. um, so you got the good convenience. You, I mean, you have the high quality. You should be able to extract it whether you're using um, a pair of, of speakers like this or behind me. That's a pair of the handmade Denon headphones that cost like 1600 bucks handmade in Japan by a little Japanese lady, mm. something like that. Um, <laughs> then they hear those headphones or they hear this system and it just shows them that, wow, you'll be right. amazed um, how much of a difference it actually makes. Right. I mean, it's really access to some of this gear and in some ways your house. <laughs> <laughs> Can we get more people to your house to hear some of this stuff? Yeah. Well, the funny thing is I do, if you go on to YouTube, um, I, during COVID, we, um, at Sound United, I started a YouTube channel. So if you look up, if you Google Sound United training mm -hmm. on, on YouTube, we've done several sessions about, you know, how, how to set up subwoofers and right. what is surround sound and, and high res music distribution through wireless and all that type of stuff. And they're really fun. Like when we, when we talk about surround sound, we bring in, you know, the the, what, the, the lead engineer from Odyssey and mm -hmm. um, uh, IMAX and and DTS, and so we're talking about how immersive audio works. It's not just coming from me; it's coming from the lead engineer from for DTS, right. talking about how DTS X works. And but during those sessions, you'll see behind me, I do it in my I do it in I, I did it in my living room, so you can see my big old rack of gear. And everybody right. was always commenting about what the heck is behind you? Because <laughs> right. I wanted it to be visible. I have to right. Say, absolutely. Well, let's um let's step into I don't know if people know what Sound United is or was and some of the brands that are kind of part of your current job. Okay. So you're you're right now called the director of global brand activation. Okay. So so <laughs> Let's first talk about what the title is, and then we'll talk about what 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 we do. Sure. So brand active, so global director brand activation. Real simple, not really simple. Big fancy <laughs> name, fun job. A, a product team and brand team come up with a great new product, something like that behind me, hmm. and I get to work with the product team and the brand team about what are the new technologies included. How do we simply explain it to consumers, the press, to dealers, to salespeople? And, um, and, and how do you relate to benefits? So my job is basically I get to play with the newest stuff in the company and figure out why would somebody buy it and what should we show? So, mm -hmm. so that's the fun part. So, and, and that's for Sound United products. So Sound United, think of Sound United as the Volkswagen group of audio. If you look at Volkswagen, Volkswagen owns Volkswagen, Audi, um, Lamborghini, Porsche, um, Ducati motorcycles, a list of vehicles, all that stuff deals with mobility, all under the Volkswagen group, but each brand is operated as its own independent brand. Well, Sound United's like that for music. So Sound United owns Denon, Marantz, Polk Audio, Definitive, Bowers and Wilkins, and Class A. Okay. So, and now Sound United is now under a group called uh, Massimo Consumer Audio, a Massimo Consumer Audio. So, so now it would, instead of being Sound United, I am the Massimo Consumer Audio Group, and they hold they own all those brands you mentioned, Denon, Marantz, and everything else. Each brand is focused on one, on the same goal, mu music. How to relate sound, mm -hmm. but each brand is designed to fit the needs of a different customer. So, so think, and that is a benefit to a consumer. If you look at a high-end brand like Class A, they make great amplifiers, and that's what their claim to fame is. But maybe right. things such as, I don't know, Bluetooth and IR and wireless may not be their strong suit. And if you're a small right. company, where do you get those resources? That all, right. If you go back to Lamborghini, same thing. They make beautiful bodies, and they right. make beautiful motors. But things like maybe power door locks and navigation systems, they may not be that familiar with. But right. by being part of this Volkswagen group, the bigger right. brands can focus on helping them with all of those things that you expect in a car. Mm. Okay. Windows, door locks, navigation, 
um, and you want that to be reliable so the brand itself can focus on what makes it special. And that's what we do. Class A can now focus on amplification, um, uh, DDA converters and stuff like that. And those basic things you would expect right. on your receiver, IR remote control, control system right. integration, um, wireless music transmission, HDMI switching, that right. is not their specialty. They can, they can, they can lean on the, the bigger group. Those other things that we're talking about do not define what separates a Denon from a class A, but they're right. expected on whether you have a Denon or a class A. I see. Um, so do they come to you after they finish the product and say, hi, Philip, how do we sell this? Or do they come to you before in the planning stage? Well, well, that, well I, a lot of times I do get, I am lucky enough to be, even when I was at Sony and Yamaha, I, I was lucky enough to be kind of involved in that, um, in the in the selling process or developing a product process. Because if you build a product, right. it needs to appeal to someone. And, right. it, and so who does it, it appeal to and what does it have the proper features to meet right. the needs of that particular person. Um, my team of brand activators, I have mem I have um, uh, 16 or so in the US, 20 or something in Europe. I have members in, in Asia. Their job is to work with salespeople and dealers and work to and, and and talk to Coop and help them talk to consumers right. directly. So they have a, they have an understanding of what the actual needs are in the store and what customers are asking for and how do you explain the messaging. So we can kind of guide them on if you're going to make this and it's going to fit into this particular product category, these are the most notable features you should be mm. focusing on. Because you can put 15 or 20 features into a product, but there's only probably nine or 10 that really separate you that are unique selling propositions. Mm. What are those right. and, and how do you relay it? So being involved earlier in the process um, it's helpful because sometimes they may remove something really simple. Like we were doing TVs at Sony and they would say, oh, um, we're going to take off. We're going to we don't need to have a detachable power cord. And we would tell the, the, the engineers, no, you have to have that power cord. And they're like, well, it's going to cost an extra, you know, two dollars. But right. I'm like, yeah, but if you're hanging a 75 inch TV, being <laughs> able to plug the power cord in, lift the TV in and plug it in is yeah. a lot is worth it for that. Right. That one reason is why. Right. A, an installer may recommend a Samsung over a Sony right. because it's a pain in the butt to lift a 75 inch TV <laughs> right. that has a non detachable power cord. So, so being involved at the beginning to kind of right. relay those types of things is important. And it happens with hi-fi pieces too. So have you, have you been doing the same thing for each company, Yamaha, Sony, and now the all seven or eight sound United brands? When I, when I've always like my whole dream when I was a kid was to be a factory rep. You know, you see the guys that come in with the <laughs> the logo shirts and they played. They had they brought in all the hot new products and you got to play with it. So that's yeah. that was like my dream job. So, but at the same time, what I, I was also I also liked that it wasn't I wasn't really into the numbers and how many what's the margins and all that stuff. I was just into the product. Mm -hmm. So so being in so I've always been involved in more of the training side of things. So I get to be the person that's kind of the, the expert on the particular brand, but I get to focus on the parts of it that I like the most, the technology and the, and the customer benefits. When I got to, um, when I worked for retail, I put together a little book called Solution Selling. Mm -hmm. And it was about selling, a, uh, there's, you got, when, when you walk into a store, a lot of times you may walk in and say, I need a TV. Mm -hmm. But what you don't need a TV, a TV is, you don't, you're not really looking for a need, you're looking to solve a goal. Right. What is your goal? If your goal is to watch sports, you need more than a TV. You need a TV, you need a source, you need a cable to connect it, you need a service, you need a bunch of stuff to make that happen. And right. in order to be a to give a a, a customer a great experience, you got to make sure that you that you solve the complete solution. Right. So when I went the so that became kind of the thing that I got fo focused in when I was at Yamaha, it was solutions. It was you go to a university and they may buy pianos for their music department, drums for their their marching band, a PA system for their for their um, arena, and a recording equipment for for particular people, and then maybe hi-fi gear for um, the music teachers to play back right. music. When I went right. to Sony, you, um, it was a bunch of products. It was you, cameras, TVs. If you want a home mm. theater, you got to buy a TV. You got to buy you got to buy a sound system. 
you need a you, you got to buy a source or maybe right. a blu-ray player so it was it was all about the complete solution and that kind of even applies here um we can provide with the exception of cables everything hmm. you need for a audio solution your hmm. source your 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 power right and your speakers so 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 i've always been kind of involved in that you know we got to sell the complete solution right and we have to think about what of all those things and how those things all work together and that's the right. funny part of the job right right well all of the companies are essentially competitors and and seven of them are now under the same umbrella but they're still competitors amongst themselves Denon and Marantz. Well, if you compete. think about it, remember you go back yeah. to the Volkswagen Group thing. Yeah. Porsche and Audi are under the same umbrella. But if you look at an Audi, an Audi, I like to say, is um, precise, direct, and to the point. Right. And that's kind of how Denon lives. They're the they're bigger. Audi's bigger than Porsche. You know, they still deal with a premium customer, right. and it's about precision and direct and get to the point. Marantz is like a Porsche. People wear their t-shirts. It's It's got, not only is it high performance, but it has a memorable appearance and a memorable sound. A Porsche, nothing sounds like a Porsche. Nothing looks like a Porsche. You know, right. it's it's the heritage of the brand. It's the logo that makes it. People are walking around with their t-shirts and things like that. And that's right. where Marantz is. It's high performance with a little bit of style. Mm. Um, both brands, both of those brands don't compete against each other. So just like Marantz and Denny don't compete against you, they're designed for a different customer with a different idea of what they're looking like. They sound different, they look okay. different, and, and, and it's up to the customer to choose which one's best. Same thing with Bowers and Wilkins. Think of Bowers and Wilkins as our Lamborghini. Mm. Um, that company has, you can make a $30,000 speaker. So let's make the tweeter out of a diamond, you know, a diamond okay. dome. But then you look at somebody like Polk, Polk would be like Volkswagen. Um, how can I get the most performance for right. um, for the buck? So mm -hmm. Volkswagens, you drive and you go, man, I can't believe how good this car is for, right. for what we're paying. And that's what happens with a Polk product. You go, man, this thing performs amazingly well right. for its price point. So Polk really, where it lives, does not compete um, against Bowers. So by having these Americans associate a brand with a price point, let's be honest. If, mm -hmm. um, and, and companies like Toyota have figured it out. They made a beautiful Toyota at 80,000 bucks. And everybody said, why didn't you buy a Mercedes? Mm -hmm. So they had to form Lexus so to, right. to deal with that particular customer. So by us having different brands, we can we can cater to different um, um, customers' expectations, different styles, right. um, different appearances. So they really don't compete against each other because there is a little bit of overlap, but the customers they're talking to are kind of different customers. Okay, so you you have to come up with all these differences. It sounds like, mm -hmm. like in in maybe in the in the consumer in the consumer mind, a receiver is a receiver and a speaker is a speaker. Mm -hmm. But you have to explain, and the salespeople have to explain what the differences are, why this brand costs more. Exactly. And, yeah, exactly. But if you go to cars, or you go to fancy knives, or you go to right. high end clothing, or you go to custom suits. Yeah. Or you go to high-end furniture, you still have to do the same thing. People think a couch is a couch is a couch. Or yeah. a mattress is a mattress until you, someone shows you something better. Um, right. Same thing with cars. You know, Why would I buy a luxury car or a premium sports car when the speed limit is 55 miles an hour and I'm right. just driving it to work? So, some, so every premium luxury experience has this challenge. Okay. Now, it's our job to show customers and, and clients and – enthusiast that there's a difference and then based on you only have a certain amount of disposable income it's up to them to determine where they're going to spend it am i going to buy a new Marantz hi-fi piece or am i going to am i going to spend that money to go on vacate i'm to go to vegas for vacation right you know so, certain people i can't tell you how many ten thousand dollar speakers i've stuck in two thousand dollar cars because hmm. that customer decided that their disposable income for their life that makes them the, the happiest is a spend it on hi-fi. So okay. Is that when you were working in the retail when yeah. they were you were selling car audio, I guess, at that yeah, point. And and even car I'm talking even car even even hi-fi gear. Okay. Um, um people would come in and he'd be in, he'd live in a motorhome, a mm. mobile home, and he would have a thirty thousand dollar hi-fi system because to him that or he or she right. um that was their most passionate thing. I tell people all the time 
you should spend the majority of your disposable income on the thing you use the most. And mm -hmm. for many people, except for their bed and their car, there's very few things they'd use more than their hi-fi system. You use right. it to watch sports, use it to watch movies, use it to kind of escape after work to watch. The, I mean, you're using it a lot. And if, right. and if you think about that and you have, like I used to tease people at retail, Guy would pull in. I would show him. We'd go in with the parent, with the with the family, and we would just blow him away with this great home theater demonstration. Back at then, back then it was like, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger movies and you <laughs> right. know things like that. And they would just absolutely love it. And then we would give them the price, and it's oh, that's too expensive. And then I would look outside, and I'd say, hey, you got a boat hitch on the back of your truck. And I'm like, tell me about your <laughs> boat. And they would talk about their boat, and they spent 30000 or 40000 on the boat. And I'm like, right. how often do you use your boat, and how often do you use your stereo system? Which one's right. a better use of your funds? You right. know? So no, you you, get across. No, you make, a, you make a valid point that I don't think people spend enough on audio. And it's often mm -hmm. the last thing. They'll spend mm -hmm. more on a TV. Mm -hmm. They'll spend 2000 or 3000 on an OLED TV, mm -hmm. but they'll spend $300 on a sound bar and say, I'm, I'm done. Yeah. How, um, why do you think that is? Because until someone shows them that how much of an impact, because, you know, when you walk into us, if, if I walk into a Best Buy store, I can get the, I quickly understand the impact of a big TV. Um, mm -hmm. Simply, I walk in and wow, that one is so much bigger, right? right. It takes a more controlled environment mm -hmm. and a little bit of more time to set up a demo to show the difference between moving up. So, so people, so seeing a 55 inch TV next to an 85 inch TV, even in a harsh environment, um, a Costco, a Best Buy floor, um, any your local retailer online, you get it. You go, okay, it's going to be a bigger experience. Right. It's but it's difficult to do that when you just in you know, um, if it's just a bunch of you know with audio equipment, unless you have you actually have the demonstration. Because I stress to all of my guys and anybody I talk to, do not remove, reduce. Mm -hmm. You'll get a better experience going from instead of getting the 85 inch OLED, getting the 75 inch OLED with a sound system. Than you will ever get. I guarantee you, if you pay, if you play a movie on an 85 inch OLED, and I play a movie on an 85 inch OLED, a 75 inch OLED, a smaller TV with right. Dolby Atmos and DTS right. and all the, the trickery, mm -hmm. I guarantee you're going to be far more engaged in that movie. If I swap the 85 inch OLED for an 85 inch LCD TV, and I spent all that money on a sound system, I guarantee you the experience right. is going to be way better. And so, we always say you got to make sure that you. It's a, it should be kind of an even mix: fifty percent audio, fifty percent right. um, video, and you'll end up with a with a better experience. Even with projectors, I tell people I'd rather have you buy, you know, a five thousand dollar projector and five grand worth of gear than a ten thousand right. dollar projector. You're just not going to get the same experience that way. Well, talk to me about projectorreviews.com. How did you start that amongst? all the eight brands you have to manage. How do you fit in running a website okay. at the same time? So um, one of the things that I used to always do was I was, one of the things I did at Sony for a long time was my job there was the, I was the product information manager for Sony Electronics. So I was the person, hung out with the engineers and, and the product teams to come up with, to explain ex technologies. So whether it's um, digital cameras, um, television, sound, whatever. So one of the things that I would always do is I would deal with reviewer relations. So I would be the person that took them a TV or a projector, and then I would sit down with them and talk about, look how great this Sony projector is, you know, type of thing. So along the way, I built a lot of relationships with um, different reviewers because I would see them all the time, reviewers and press. So when I left, um, when I left Sony, Sound United is a sound company. We make no mm -hmm. video. So there's no right. skin in the game when it comes to, to video. So right. people started asking me, hey, can you write reviews um, on projectors and on televisions because you are infinitely familiar with it? So I chose to start writing reviews for projectors for a gentleman named Art Fireman, who was the original editor, uh, owner and editor of Projector Reviews. Mm -hmm. So along the way, I would um, write articles while I was at Sound United. And then Art was getting to the point where he wanted to retire. 
And he looked at me and said, well, you have, you understand the industry, you, you understand the products and, 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 and the customer. And then my wife, Diane, she is always been in publishing. So she's been in publishing and marketing for 20 something years. Mm. So as a team, we're really good. She deals with the, she's the editor and chief. She deals with all of the, the stuff that I don't want to do, the advertising and the editor, all of that type of stuff. And I, what I do is I run a, a group of reviewers. I get to mm. play with the better products that I want to do. And I am, I just make sure that the reviews are done um, properly. So I still get to play with all these projectors. Cause if I didn't, if I didn't have this, I would still want to have a high end Sony or JVC projector or right. Barco in, um, in my house. And now I get to actually um, experience that because it's part of my, my job. Yeah. I've, I've been thinking about this. I think you have the most fun job in all of consumer audio and video. Like you, <laughs> I do. I do. you I have do. got to whatever you thought was the factory floor manager from before. I think you've surpassed that. Yeah. And you get to play with all the toys. Yeah. And, and I, and I don't take it for granted. Like my wife is like, when are you going to retire? I'm like, you don't retire. I mean, this is my hobby. So when do you, when do you retire from your hobby? And, right. and, and that's the thing. If you ever got to the point where it wasn't about the product and it was about the numbers and it was mm. about, it was, it was about profit over performance and it wasn't about, you know, the product itself, then maybe, right. you know, but right now, um, every day is fun because I, I get to play with stuff that I would want to play with even if I didn't do this. So I'm getting paid to, to do my hobby. So how could you complain about that? Yeah. And, uh, I, I'm certainly not complaining and you're not, um, what's what, what question I always get. And I'm sure you get it a lot is just tell me what's the best. Cause you've, you have access to all the top gear from all the brands over the last 20 years. Well, we always say you have to add, you have to, you have to qualify that mm. because we all know you want better picture and you want better sound. The right. next question is, do you want to, do you want it to be highlighted in your, in your home or not? Mm. So if you say, I want great sound with, um, but I don't want to see it, well, that may be something like a, um, a, a Bowers custom theater or Bowers architectural um, series right. stuff. So you could, it'll sound, if it's done installed properly and your room's treated properly, it'll sound incredible, but you mm. won't see it. But then some people say, I want to see it. And, and seeing it actually is more, it's funny. Installation is really expensive. But making something sit on your floor that looks really beautiful is almost as expensive. So, right. so the first thing is, do you want to see it or not? Same thing with with, with projections or television. Um, a lot of times people love projectors because if I get a motorized screen, I have a gigantic picture when it's on, right? But it's completely gone when it's off. So, so it so a lot of it has to do with what's um, first. What is your use case? How do you want to live your life? And then based on that. What is the best product that will fit your lifestyle that gives you the best performance? Because because there's really good invisible speakers, there's really good um, right. um, floor standing speakers, there's really good um, TVs that you can see, and there's really good TVs that disappear when right. they're off. It just depends on the first thing is how do you want it to fit into your lifestyle, and then we can work on finding the right the right product for you. Right. I think, like you said earlier, you sell solutions, not. Mm -hmm products. And that kind of speaks to what you mm -hmm. alluded to before is how do you get that solution, which is going to be different based on everyone's exactly. budget. Yeah. Um, but, but as a projector expert, I got to ask, like, mm -hmm. what were you, how would you point someone to say, it's time to go from a regular flat panel TV and say, why you need a projector? Well, the, I always say, you know, why measure your TV in inches when you can measure it in feet, right? <laughs> so, oh, great. You got a 60-inch TV. I got a 10-foot TV, you know? So so anything that you watch, and it's amazing. Like, when I first started getting um, doing the projector thing, um, my house is, 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 is now Super Bowl Central. Because the first mm -hmm. time you come over and you watch Super Bowl on a 120 or 140-inch screen, it changes your perspective, you know? Mm -hmm. Or my, my kids' friends will come over and they drop the screen and they're playing Halo on a on a 10 foot screen. It, it changes everything. Um, it's far more immersive. It's far more engaging. And I don't care whether you're watching Game of Thrones on HBO 
or you're playing Halo or you're watching the Super Bowl or I guarantee you everybody's going to be calling me for World Cup. It's going to be, can I come over? Can I come over? Can I come over? Because the experience of having a screen of that scale really mm -hmm. does pull you far more um, in into the action. And when it comes to dollars per inch, you still can't touch a uh, projection. So you can get a, go and get an 85 inch TV now for, I remember when I started doing 80 inch TVs at Sony, they were 60 to 80 grand. Actually, they start mm -hmm. off at 80,000 bucks. The first 85 we did. Um, I think it was 100 inch was 80,000. The six, the 85 inch was only 40 K. Now you can get an 85 inch TV for 3000, 3000 bucks, mm -hmm. but, and it's big until you see a projector because projectors start at a hundred and something. And, um, it's still, and then can you imagine trying to get an 85 inch flat panel T, um, flat panel TV up a walk up apartment in New York right. city or right. making it disappear when you don't want to see it. So there's. That's why you're starting to see more things like laser TV. So mm. it has a better sound system than a regular TV. They're bigger than a regular TV. They're bright enough to use throughout the day and during the night. But now we're talking starting sizes of 100 plus. You so know? when you say laser TV, I think you mean ultra short throw projector or UST yeah. projector, yeah, exactly. right? So, so before, um, the, the official term, if you look at um, high what is the, official the term, term laser TV, Okay. But what they were trying to say is nobody wants to say you want a 4K laser ultra short throw smart projector. <laughs> Too long. Which is what a, with a built-in sound system, right. which, is, which is what a laser TV. So when you hear the term, we always – we started to use that term. It's almost like Kleenex when you meant I want it. Right. I went, you know. So if most um, – so laser TV means basically it's a TV replacement. It's laser. So it has the same lifespan as a regular TV turns on and turn off. You ain't going to worry about the bulb. It's right. smart. So it has all your YouTubes and Netflixes and all that stuff. It has a high enough resolution yeah. to, um, to, uh, to give you what you need. It's got a big sound system, which is better than a regular TV sound system. So it has right. all the things you would expect on a flat, a smart flat panel TV mm -hmm. um, from a projector. So for many, for many customers, that may be their first in entry into projection. Right. Then you look at the theater guys, and we're talking 160, 165 inch, you know, mount in the back of the room or business applications and things like that. Projectors are still the approach, the best approach for, for big, right. big displays. Well, how much better can video get? You, do you think we've hit like a peak? Well, um, it all has to do with visual acuity. You know, mm -hmm. always, if you want to be, if you want to sit bit close. To a very big image and the resolution, and you want it to be clear, you need more resolution. So, so say a 4K TV, you could sit one and a half picture heights away from that display. And right. um, on an 8K TV, you could sit um, 0.75 picture heights away. What does right. that mean for for the average person? These days, with the resolution that we have, you can't sit too close. Right. To a display, you can have as big of a display as you want in any room you want, and you can never sit so close that it won't look sharp. Right. And so now we, since we have that resolution thing can't ta tackled, let's focus on the other things that are more noticeable to people, and mm -hmm. that is better contrast, ability to see, to make out details of a black jacket in the shadows, um, high, better colors. Um, like for example, you hear like things like Rec 2020. Well, what does that mean? It means that. You can reproduce the color of a London bus. The London bus color is outside of the color range of the an old TV back in 1990 or 2000s. It's it's it's, it's almost within range of a regular TV. So you can reproduce all the colors in nature. You can see all the shadow detail. It looks more like reality, and a lot of that goes beyond. It's reality is sharp, rich mm -hmm. color. And all of what we call brightness range, from the darkest darks to the brightest brights with all the shades in between. We got the resolution down. Right. Now we can focus on the other things, which is better color and better brightness and contrast capabilities. So things are still getting better in video, it sounds like. Oh, like yeah, it is. There, and there's still a difference between a $1,000 projector and a $50,000 projector. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, so for example, um, there were... Uh, 
you, you first you have your resolution and they did whether that's a dlp or whether that's a you know three chip l cost device like what's used right. in a, a sony or jvc that's going to give you the resolution the right. next thing that makes a project that determines what a projector would be is its light source um for a long time it was bulbs now we're going to either laser or led mm -hmm. by using multiple lasers or multiple leds in red green and blue they can they can reproduce a bigger triangle of color gamut of colors which right. means you can you can reproduce colors that you couldn't see before and right. and so now that's where you're seeing the advancements it's better light sources better laser dimming um mm. if you think about um the light source on a projector used to always be on it was a bulb so if right. i wanted black i would have to be like almost like blinds i would be closing the blinds right. to try to hide the sun outside and some of that would leak in with things like LED and, and laser, that light source cannot be regulated. So if it goes into a dark scene, I can turn the light down, which is what they've been doing on TVs for, for a while. Right. Um, so you're starting to see much better contrast, much better black levels, much more vibrant colors. And then when you add more brightness to it, it looks better for HDR and it makes it easier to use during the day. Okay, is is this mainly on the projector side you were talking about, or is this on the OLED and the L? This is on all sides. all all side all types yeah. of TVs. So so um so if we talk about televisions or video, um, originally we talk about that brightness range thing. First, there was the color triangle. How many colors can you represent in a little triangle? You see those little color right. gamut triangles. Well, the first thing is to make the triangle bigger, right? Um, so because there was a lot of colors that were outside the triangle. So let's right. make the triangle of colors that we can choose from bigger. Mm -hmm. But then you have to look at, say it's Ferrari red. What is Ferrari red in the shadows and is Ferrari red in bright sunlight? That is brightness. So when you add brightness to color gamut, that triangle, you know, with a volume of colors. Right. So as you add more brightness, you get a bigger volume of colors. And OLED does, does a pretty good job of making a lot of different colors, but its brightness was limited. So mm. now OLEDs are trying to get more brightness to make more of those a, a bigger box of a bigger box of colors. Um, LCDs were really good at the brightness, but they failed at the bottom. So they're trying to work. Right. So while OLED is trying to make it brighter, L LED right. is trying to make better blacks. So both are trying to are both working to get better. OLEDs are getting brighter. LCDs are getting better with black level. That also applies with with um, with LC with with with, with um, projectors. Right. Local dimming means better blacks. Laser light sources, uh, multi zone, multi multi laser, bigger diodes, right. more diodes, more LEDs means that I can now regulate it to get better blacks, and I have more brightness to get um, to get it brighter. And right. on top of that, I can build a bigger triangle of colors. So everybody's trying to do the same thing because now for many years, if um, a, a, your TV could easily do all the colors and all of the brightness information that was found in a VCR tape, mm -hmm. your TV could do all of the colors and all of the brightness information that was found in a DVD. Mm -hmm. your, your TV could do all the brightness and all the color information that was found in broadcast or even found in a Blu-ray. Now mm -hmm. with 4K HDR, or 4K UHD Blu-ray disc, and even Disney Plus on a streaming service or Netflix on a streaming service, those services and that content has more color information and more brightness information than what most TVs, most displays can reproduce. So now the displays are now back to chasing the, mm -hmm. um, the source because the source has more information on it in it than most displays can, can reproduce. Okay, so sounds like we're close to catching up with the source. Uh, yeah. and we're getting closer to catching up with the source, um, which is which is a weird thing. For many many years, the sources were better, um, and but now the source can exceed the the the, the machines. But we got a while to go, you know. Um, right. And TVs and and projectors are going to get better and better better. All right, I want to switch over to audio real quick and wrap up shortly. Okay. Okay. Um, but on the audio side, do you think we've hit like peak audio? Like, is it the the best speakers? How how much better can it get? Well, there's um, we go back to the fact that now because of your um, we're going from CD to high res music and and things like that. Right. Um, Forty kilohertz frequency responses stuff like now we're getting to a point 
where there's a lot of information in the in the content that te- that speakers are struggling to achieve. Then you still have to worry about uh, ca- uh, even if even if you have the the a speaker colors the signal. Mm-hmm. So the biggest challenge with a speaker is one: can you recreate it all? And the next thing: can you do no harm? Um, if I if I strike a bell or a drum hit, if the cabinet vibrates. That adds additional sound into the room, which right. um, colors the sound. So the biggest challenge, and it always continues to be the challenge <clears throat> when it comes to audio equipment, is being able to reproduce the sound without adding any additional coloration. So if you look at every single speaker company, that's what they're focused on. Because if you look at, oh, this can reproduce 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz flat response. Well, guess what? In an anechoic chamber, pretty much every speaker can do that. You know, or most big speakers can do that. The question is, can you reproduce those frequencies without adding any coloration? So when mm-hmm. I when I when I um, hit the str- the string of a guitar, and that cone vibrates, is it vibrating pistonically, perfectly straight up and down? Is it warped? Right. Is the cabinet res- um, adding resonance to it? You know, how does it how does it interact with the room? Um, right. All of those things you have to think about. So. So our biggest problem is making sure is we always should try to make the speaker disappear. You should be mm-hmm. able to hear the music or um, the, 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 the creator's intent, not right. the speaker. And, and as you spend more and more money, that's when the speakers disappear. I could play um, Pink Floyd or um, uh, Led Zeppelin or Bach on a, a pair of speakers and you'll recognize it as Bach, but it'll sound like Bach being played back on a pair of speakers. Right? right, a good set of speakers or a good hi-fi system, it's just your favorite artist in your room. And the 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 better we get at that, and the less coloration, the cleaner the sound, um, the more that you're transported to that space where, like I said, you right. close your eyes and it's like there's a person in front of you because that information's in the content. The question right. is, can your system extract it in a way that it turns it into an experience, like you're there instead of you're listening to a recording? And that's what separates hi-fi from playing back music. Okay, so this will lead me into my last question. What is your definition of audio nirvana? It's funny. Whenever I hear a good system, I, you, it's like I can tell when it's right. And, and to me, it's like I always say a lot of times you may go see my – you may have went to go see your favorite artist. I don't care who it is. Prince, John Legend. Eric Clapton, I don't care. I don't care who it is. And most of the time, what you've heard your entire life is a PA system playing your favorite artist. You haven't really heard your artist, Mm -hmm. your favorite artist, whether it's the Beatles, you name it. When it's right, it literally feels like if it's the Beatles, it's John and Ringo and everybody sitting in your room playing to you. It's like Bob Dylan is in your space or Johnny Cash or, Mm. or, um, or Bob Marley. And when I hear that, that makes me happy. When it feels like I'm at a concert or I'm actually engrossed in that experience and I'm not even thinking about the fact there's any electronics in the room, that's to me is what Audio Nirvana is. And same thing with a movie. If I'm in it and, and I'm supposed to be in a jungle and it feels like I'm in a jungle and I completely forget where I'm at and I'm engrossed in what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing, that's Nirvana. Until you get there, and it still sounds like I'm playing a movie on a stereo system or a surround system, or I'm playing Bob Dylan on a high on a, on a stereo system. You haven't hit the audio Nirvana yet. Mm. So it sounds like total immersion, total the- eternal, total immersion and realism, because you want to be immersed, but you want to be immersed the way that the, the content creator intended for you mm-hmm. to be immersed. You don't want to, you right. know, adding fake reverb and stuff like that is not what the creator intended. You want to feel like if I do it right, and I've done it with speakers. That if it has echo in the room or size in the room, a good hi-fi system will relay the size of the room. So you'll feel like you're in an arena mm. without any off of a record, without any artificial stuff done. It's just it's in the recording, and can you capture right. and extract all that information to take you where you need to go? Do you think you found all your Nirvana in your system, or still searching? I think that I've that when I when I I am so happy with the stuff that I have and the stuff that we sell, but it can always be better. And and you'll hear it. You'll say each brand has their unique selling propositions. 
So for example, Polk SDA images like no other speaker, but the driver design and the tweeter design and the cabin design of a Bowers is unparalleled. So you're like, wow, I wish I could take a little, and eventually we'll get a little bit more of this one. We'll blend with right. that one and right. we'll get even closer and closer. So, so we haven't gotten there yet, but right. um, each year, if you compare the new Bowers to the old Bowers or, right. um, or a, a, a new Polk reserve to an older Polk speaker, it's noticeable. Um, hmm. If I compare, um, I loved my JVC. I used to have a, a Sony uh, VW um, 915 laser projector as my kind of my reference piece. Right. The new one is shockingly better. So oh. each, each um, and that's the benefit of what I do because every year it gets better. And I'm lucky enough that every year I get the new piece and I can try out the better. Right. Well, um, I think that's a great way to end it. Um, we've been speaking with Philip Jones, Director of Global Brand Activation at Sound United and owner, co-owner of ProjectorReviews.com. And uh, yeah, I thank you so much for your time and sharing so much knowledge. And, and Brian, thank you for inviting me because, you know, I can talk well, forever because I get a kick out of this. Yeah, I saw there's like an hour 45 minute on HDMI 2.1. So yes. if so you check really out the Sound United, to... check out Sound United um, training. At, um, right. So if you go to Sound United training on YouTube, you'll see my videos that are dealing with audio and right. things like HDMI and all those kind of home theater related stuff. Or right. if you go to projector reviews on right. YouTube, you will also see our stuff on projectors where we interview actually projector companies and stuff like that. All right. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time. And uh, yeah, this has been fun. So oh, it's, it's been a pleasure. It's been fun. Thank you. We'll see everyone next time. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.